On behalf of the McGill Society of Montreal, I would like to welcome you all to our second gardening webinar. And this time it's about microgreens, titled Vegetables in the Fast Lane. My name is Julie and I'm the president of McGill Society of Montreal. And I'm here with Micheline, one of our board members and the organizer of tonight's event. And we're really happy that you're able to join us tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the McGill Society of Montreal and what we do. We are a branch of the McGill Alumni Association and our goal is to organize exclusive educational, cultural and also social events for the general alumni located in Montreal to help maintain their contact with McGill. Now, unfortunately, we've been a bit quiet over the past couple of years, but uh, now we're busy uh, planning for some more upcoming in-person events. And if you'd like to be kept informed of our events, please follow us on our Facebook page and also keep an eye out in the McGill in Myville newsletter. And if you like these type of events and you're looking for volunteering opportunities, please feel free to reach out to us on our Facebook page, or you can also try and message me on the chat today. And we'll be happy to get in touch with you. Now, I would also like to take the opportunity to make the first public announcement of a project that is very meaningful to the McGill Society of Montreal that we've been working on for the past year that we hope will benefit students for generations to come. The MSM has now kicked off a fundraising campaign to establish the Melissa Nock Memorial Bursary in memory of our dear friend and also past president of the Ms. McGill Society of Montreal, Melissa Nock. To honor her love of music, this bursary will aim to provide financial support to talented music students, both at the graduate and undergraduate level at the Schoolage School of Music. Now, in order for our bursary to become self-sufficient and to exist in perpetuity, the MSM needs to raise $50,000. And fortunately, we have been able to raise 42,000 up until now but we'll still, and we still have about less than $8,000 left to go to reach our goal. To help achieve our goal, we have now set up a crowdfunding page, which you can find uh, in the link in, in the chat. And I would like to ask everyone who's watching tonight to take a moment to look at our crowdfunding page and to consider making a donation. And with the number of people who are turning out tonight, Every donation, even if it's as little as 10 or $5, every donation will help us reach, uh, get us closer to our goal. So please help us out by visiting our crowdfunding page and consider making a donation. And every donation will receive a tax receipt. So on that note, without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Micheline, who can introduce our guest speaker tonight and we can learn more about microgreens. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm happy to introduce to, uh, to you today our speaker, Mr. David Luis, whom I've known since forever. Uh, I think we first met in 1989. That gives you away a bit of my age and perhaps yours, David. So oh. David, gra <laughs> David graduated from McGill, McDonald campus. Uh, um, if you all know it, it's in the tip of the island in uh, saint anne de bellevue with a bachelor in agronomy in 1984 and a master's in horticulture in 1987. May, uh, David has been a member of the Art des Agronomes du Québec, and he has been a faculty lecturer in the farm management and technology program, and also in the department of plant science, where he graduated from, from 1988 until now. David is also the associate director of the farm management and technology program since 2016. He is also the author of several guides on horticultural crops, hence his presence with us today. For instance, greenhouse production of herbs, sweet potato productions, mineral deficiencies in herbs, greenhouse production of bok choy, all that can be found on the CRAC website. David, welcome today. And I would like to remind everybody to keep your uh, microphones muted. And if you have questions, we will be moderating the questions as we go. Please put them all in the chat section. David? Well, thanks very much, Mishtin. 
And good, e good evening, everyone. Um, sorry if my voice is a little bit rough. I had COVID last week, so I'm still uh, still get a bit of scratchy throat. So you may see me uh, taking sips of, uh, don't worry, this is actually water and not something else in this glass. Um, so it's nice to see so many people online interested in plants, because that's really what uh, I'm mainly interested in. And I decided to talk about a very small subject, microgreens, um, for a couple different reasons. And uh, because this is uni a university, um, there will be a quiz at the end. And uh, make sure you take notes because uh, you want to make sure you pass the course. So a um, few things that we want to talk about now. Um, just see if I can, nope used to doing too many things all at once. There we go. Okay, so let's start off with some existential questions. Uh, first of all, what are microgreens? Well, microgreens must be something important when you get an uh, entry in Wikipedia. So yes, there is actually a Wikipedia definition for microgreens and you can read all about it there. But very briefly, a microgreen is simply a very young plant. Um, it is more, um, it, it's not just a seedling, so it's not quite the same thing as a sprout. Um, it's a little bit more advanced than that, but it's not a fully mature vegetable. And so of course, one of the things that's really particular about microgreens is that they grow fast. And so we'll start off with a couple sort of, as I said, existential questions, you know, the, the why, uh, what is it, and so on and so forth, before we get into the nitty gritty, the more practical stuff. Um, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, certainly feel free to um, type your questions in through the chat. Uh, Mission will be monitoring that. <clears throat> and I can take some questions during the presentation, but there'll certainly be some time at the end for more questions. So as we said, microgreens are simply very, very young plants. And many of you may already be familiar with the idea of sprouts, uh, bean sprouts that are used in stir fries and things like that. And so people often mix up the idea of a sprout and a microgreen. So what are the differences? Well, when we talk about sprouts, we're usually talking about very young seedlings, often less than a week old. So basically you're planting seeds, allowing to grow for a few days, you're then going to eat the whole plant, that is the, the remaining seed, the stem, the leaves, uh, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, usually sprouts are grown either in the darkness or if they are grown in light, there's very little light uh, that's actually given to them. And because you're eating the entire plant, that basically means you're not growing them in soil. So you're basically just soaking the seeds in water, allowing them to sprout, and then that's pretty much it. Microgreen, a little bit different. With microgreens, we're talking about slightly older seedlings. And when we talk about old, that's old in quotation marks because we're talking about something that's one to four weeks old, uh, which is still pretty fast. If you think of growing lettuce, if any of you go at lettuce at home in the garden, what's that gonna take from seed until the time you pick your first lettuce, maybe six weeks, eight weeks or something like that. So here we're talking about lettuce that might only be three weeks old. Um, when we're eating microgreens, however, and this is different from sprouts, you're only eating leaves and stems, no roots. And this is because you're actually growing the seedlings in either soil or some substitute for soil. So we're basically cutting off the roots. Microgreens definitely require light. In fact, that's why they turn green. If they were grown in total darkness, they'd be extremely pale like bean sprouts are. So that's basically the difference between a microgreen and a sprout. And now I'm gonna try a little zoom experiment here. And I'm gonna try a little poll. And let me know if you can actually see this online here. Can you see that? All right. So a little question here. Um, so we'll see, maybe there'll be bonus points at the end. <clears throat> where people get to the right answer. Actually, this is not a, a right or wrong answer. This is more of a survey, just to find out how many people have actually been eating their, their greens uh, in the past week or past month or so on. Okay, I'll just let this run for a couple more uh, seconds to see how many answers we've got. Um, wow, got uh, over 70 answers there. This is uh, actually better than what I get in class. In class, if I get half the people participating, that's great. And we are at over 100 participants. Okay, so I think I will end the poll now. We'll take a look at the results. Okay, so can you see these on screen? 
our little bars there. So it says that uh, 35, basically a third of the respondents said they have eaten um, greens, in, microgreens in the past year, uh, about 10% in the past month, and a whopping 23% in the past week. Great. Okay. So that's excellent from a nutritional point of view. Uh, and for those of you asked if the question will be on the midterm, it definitely. So I hope you've been taking notes. Okay, so let's get rid of that and we'll move on. Here to our next slide. Here. Working with multiple screens, I sometimes get screwed up as to which screen I'm actually supposed to be using. Okay, there we go. So now why actually grow microgreens? So we know a little bit about what, what microgreens are. They're simply very young plants, but why would we actually grow them? Well, we have to think a little bit about the history of agriculture to answer this question. And a lot of plant agriculture is actually based around seeds, uh, saving seeds because seeds are dry, so you can keep them from one year to the next. Seeds are also very nutritious. Um, but there are some problems with having uh, a diet that is based on seeds. And one of the problems, of course, are seeds are tough. Uh, if you just imagine having a bowl of barley seeds, dry barley seeds, and having that for, as your breakfast cereal, you'd be pretty disappointed. So you'd be like all these grumpy teenagers saying, oh, not seeds again, mom, can't you give, do me anything better than that? Um, so of course, um, Thousands of years ago, uh, early agriculturalists learned that if you want to eat seeds, you've got to roast them or grind them or do something like that. Or what other people realized is you could actually soak seeds in water and sprout them. Because once they're sprouted, they become a lot easier to digest than dry, hard seeds of barley or corn or wheat or rice or soybeans or any other type of seed that you can think of. So if we look a little bit more at this, I mean, what is a seed? A seed is basically the means by which plants reproduce themselves. And so normally when you plant a seed in the ground, the first thing that happens is it absorbs water. Then once that seed is absorbed water, a root will start to grow. Once the root starts to grow, eventually the seed will emerge from the soil. You'll get leaves and those leaves will start to turn green. And so when we're eating microgreens, we're simply eating very, very young shoots where the seed has now become much, much softer and therefore easier to digest. So that's one of the, the ideas behind sprouting seeds is to make them easier to digest. A little bit more here about uh, seeds. So if we take a close look at a seed, and so this a teardrop thing, this is actually supposed to be a wheat seed or a barley seed. Um, and there are a couple major parts. So there's the outer coat of a seed that's often referred to as the bran. So for example, if you go to the grocery store and say, well, I want to buy wheat bran or oat bran, what you're getting is the outer seed coat of that wheat or oat or barley or whatever it is. That tends to be the toughest part of the seed and usually the hardest to digest. It's very high in fiber. Fiber, of course, is important in your diet, but it is hard to digest. Inside the seed coat is a slightly softer area called the endosperm. And in cereals like corn or wheat or rice or barley, that endosperm is made up largely of starch. So when you grind up a wheat seed uh, to make flour, flour is largely starch, so it is largely endosperm. When you buy white flour, the bran has been removed because the bran has a slightly uh, tan or brownish color to it. That's what gives the slightly darker color that you get in whole wheat flour, whole grain flour. And the third part here is the embryo, which is sometimes referred to as the germ. The germ is actually the part that once that seed sprouts will grow into a new plant. So that's where the new leaves, the new roots are actually growing from. The endosperm is not largely a nutrient reserve. As I said, in cereals, it's made up largely of starch. In other plants, the endosperm may contain a lot of protein. Okay, think of beans or peanuts, they're very high in protein, or they may be very high in oil. If you think of walnuts uh, or soybeans, there's a lot of oil in there as well. Um, so the most nutritious parts of the seed are usually the endosperm and the embryo or the germ. 
Um, that doesn't mean the seed coat isn't, has no nutrients, but maybe not quite as much as the other parts. There's actually a very ancient method of making sprouts that is still widely used today. And that is malting barley to make beer. So the idea of malting barley is that you soak barley seeds in water and you get them to start to sprout. And there's a reason for that. Yes, it does make them digestible, but starch itself um, is not that tasty. It's kind of bland. Um, so we do sorts of things to, to spice it up to make it more flavorful. flavorful. Uh, but in the case of malting barley, a lot of that starch will get converted to sugar. And sugar not only tastes sweet, it has the wonderful property of being able to be fermented. So when you're making beer, um, you start off by sprouting barley seed. Some of the starch in the barley seed gets converted to sugar, and then yeast will ferment that sugar to produce that alcohol, which of course, as we know, is the root of all evil. So of course, if you're under 18, you just forgot what I've just said. Um, so that's really the basis behind sprouting seeds is to make those seeds more digestible. And of course, in some cases, it will enhance flavor too. So this diagram here, if you remember your biochemistry class, it shows all the wonderful interactions between starch breaking down via enzymes uh, to form glucose uh, and other sugars, proteins breaking down to form amino acids, which again are more digestible. Now, it actually goes a bit farther than that. And if you read some of the scientific literature about microgreens, you'll see all these wonderful claims about how microgreens are so much more nutritious than anything else. And as it is with a lot of nutritional claims, well, you have to take that with a grain of salt, literally grain of salt, uh, because this diagram here tells you that um, spinach microgreens are way more nutritious than actually spinach leaves. And kilo for kilo, that is true. Okay, one kilo of microgreen sprouts have more nutrients than one kilo of my microgreen, uh, sorry, uh, spinach leaves. But then you have to think about quantities. I mean, how many kilos of microgreens have you eaten? So we said a third of the group here had actually eaten microgreens in the past week, but you probably did not eat a kilo. If you were lucky, you probably ate 10 or 20 grams. So uh, yes, microgreens are very nutritious. They tend to be more nutritious than the mature uh, leaf, so mature lettuce or mature spinach or uh, kale or radishes or anything uh, other vegetables you might eat. Uh, but there's always a question of quantities here too. Another reason why we might consider growing microgreens besides nutritional value and digestibility is food security. So of course, in the past two years, there's all been the, these worries about, you know, will our grocery supermarkets be empty? Uh, so you may be remembering back to the dark days of the first wave of the pandemic, where we were short of everything, it seemed, especially toilet paper and other essential things like that. Uh, and yes, it did happen that uh, the grocery shelves sometimes were missing certain things. Um, and sort of related to that is uh, just in the past six months, there's been tremendous increases in the price of food. So some people have said, well, should I actually be growing some more of my own food, so a home garden? Should I actually grow microgreens in order to save money or to simply have more fresh produce? And so a number of people have actually sort of uh, gotten into this idea that growing microgreens might actually improve food security. And that's one of the questions we actually wanna look at, see how much of that is actually true. Other people say, well, maybe this is a get rich quick scheme. Okay, I'm gonna grow microgreens because I wanna make a fortune. Uh, well, how much money is there potentially? Well, if you look at the prices of microgreens, and these are prices I've actually got from some local uh, grocery store flyers, uh, the price per kilo is, is, is incredible. So here we're looking at anywhere from about $66 to $92 per kilo. Well, that's a pretty good price. I mean, how many plants, do you know, legal plants can sell at $92 a kilo? Okay, so that, that's pretty impressive. So some people have said, well, uh, can I actually grow my own? And if you uh, go through the internet, you'll find all sorts of books and websites and YouTube uh, videos showing how you too can make fortune and uh, retire early uh, simply by growing microgreens in your basement. 
So once the kids move out, you know what to do. Uh, you can even buy kits, uh, these multi-stage kits with uh, artificial lights and things like that, where you can grow your own microgreens. But we'll come back to this idea of uh, money and microgreens later on and see if how much money we can actually make. And so now this leads to some more practical questions. If you're actually convinced that microgreens are a good idea and that you would like to grow your, some of your own, well, which microgreens would you actually, actually like to grow? There's actually a long, long list of plants that you could grow as microgreens. So here is actually an abbreviated list. Uh, if you look in various books and magazines and websites, you'll see much, much longer lists than this. Just to make some sense of it, I've tried to break this down into three categories, depending on how fast these different species grow. So on the left-hand side, we've got our, 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 our racehorses here, the, the truly fast ones here, uh, radishes, cabbage, broccoli, uh, arugula, cress, uh, a few others, corn, peas, beans, chickpeas, and lettuce. Those would be our, our, our real speed demons. Uh, at the other end of the scale, we've got our slow ones, slow being relative here, which includes some things like coriander, which is actually one of my favorite, uh, parsley, celery, basil, alfalfa, chives. Um, for those of you who've grown sprouts before, you may know that uh, you can actually grow alfalfa sprouts, just as you can grow chickpea sprouts, peach sprouts, and bean sprouts, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of plants here that could be grown as a sprout or as a, uh, as a microgreen. Now, another question here, and this one will definitely be on the exam. Uh, out of the, all the ones we've listed here, which are the top three microgreens in North America? Any guesses here? And here you actually have to enter your answers through the chat. Um, and I'll give you a hint. The answers are all on the table in front of you. So I'm asking you which you think are actually the top three. So if you can enter your, what you think are the top three in the chat and we'll see how many people have got these. Okay, the, the actual answers of course will vary a little bit from, from year to year and so on, but there are three that probably make up about 50 to 60% of all microgreen sales in North America. So, but do you want to uh, risk giving an answer? It's like being the first one to jump in the pool. The professor asks a question and nobody dares raise their hand. Got any uh, answers in the chat? Yes, there are many, David. Do you want me to read them? Okay. They're you want to fast. read off a couple? Uh, they're moving fast. I can't keep up. So I'll start with whatever I can see. Radish, cabbage, uh, radish, peas, uh, cress, peas, arugula, radish, arugula, peas, radish, arugula, peas. Flax peas, wheat peas, chickpeas, cress alfalfa, shea, alfalfa sunflower, broccoli, arugula sunflower, alfalfa, alfalfa arugula, cress, carrots, onion, celery, radish alfalfa and cress, lettuce, cress, carrot, radish, basil, lettuce. Uh, it's moving too fast. Okay. <laughs> but Thanks. alfalfa comes, uh, you know, alfalfa comes back. It's just yeah. you know, from from the way I I had to train my tongue and my 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 lip. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I heard. Uh, I would say out of the list that you just read off, I would say there are two that you mentioned are definitely in the top three, but there's one that I'm not sure anybody mentioned it. So these are our top three. So several people mentioned radish. Yeah, that's definitely one of the top three. Several people mentioned peas. I don't think many people mentioned sunflowers. Okay, so sunflowers so there, are actually one of the there top were, three. There, were, there was sunflower, I missed it. Like okay, I said, a couple people mentioned that. Fast. Okay. Sunflower, radish came, and peas also came. I can't count how many times. But. Okay, yeah, I remember here you said mentioning radish and peas several times. So that's definitely in the top three. So these three species, as I said, probably make up about 50 to 60% of uh, microgreen sales in North America. Uh, several people mentioned alfalfa. Alfalfa is more widely grown as a, as a sprout than a microgreen. So meaning that it's not grown quite as long, it's not as green, it's often grown in darkness, uh, but you can actually grow micro, uh, alfalfa at a slightly more mature stage. So there are probably some reasons why these species come up more often. And I'll just look quickly at, again, some of these here. So maybe before we get into that, we can just ask ourselves, what's the ideal plant for a microgreen? 
So there's a couple of things we want to look for. Number one, it's got to be fast growing. These are high value plants. They, uh, you're not getting tons and tons produced in, a, in, in an area. So therefore, the only way you can actually justify growing them is if you can grow them for a couple of weeks, harvest them, and then grow another batch. So if you can, every two or three weeks, you can grow another batch, it's worthwhile. If it took three months, it would not be worth your time. Second thing, it must not be toxic. Well, of course, that may seem obvious, uh, but there are a lot of things that people have said, oh, wouldn't it be fun to try this? So for example, never grow tomatoes as a microgreen. Number one, they would taste terrible. Number two, tomato leaves are actually mildly poisonous. Now, tomato leaves won't kill you, uh, but they may spoil your day. Uh, just as the seedlings of eggplant are also mildly toxic. So we don't wanna uh, plant anything that's toxic there. Whereas all the ones that we've mentioned here are actually perfectly safe to eat. Uh, flavor. So why is it that we, some of those species kept coming back? Well, radishes, one of the ones that uh, was the, one of the species that was mentioned several often in our, our sort of ersatz poll there. Um, well, it does, the my, radish microgreens actually do taste somewhat like radishes. So they have that slightly spicy, mustardy, radishy flavor, even when they're very, very young sprouts. So you've got some flavor that you're adding. Um, there are other things too, um, that again, we're mentioning flavor. I should have mentioned odor as well. Um, one of my students says that he finds that um, chickpea, you know, mung bean sprouts smell like death. Um, now I'm not sure if that's actually true. That may be just because they're often stored in sort of airtight con uh, conditions. And so they, the odor does, uh, does build up, uh, but that is sort of an issue there. Um, for example, alfalfa that some people mention, uh, a lot of people like alfalfa either as a sprout or as a microgreen. Personally, I found it, I taste sort of like soap. Um, so it's not one of my favorites and I actually much prefer radishes. Other things to look for are color. Um, and this may be one of the reasons why microgreens are starting to push out sprouts because sprouts, well, they're so pale. Uh, it's nice to, you know, or pink, no, pale, that's, that's. It's uh, politically incorrect. We'll say pigmentally challenged, uh, lacking chlorophyll. Uh, whereas microgreens, because they're grown in light, will have an intense color, usually green. But we'll see some examples of micro, uh, microgreens that in fact are not green, but are other colors. And of course, texture. And of course, you might say, well, isn't that obvious? Shouldn't food always have a nice texture? But there are a couple species there for which I have my doubts based on texture. So let's look at a couple examples there. And one of the common ones I mentioned was the sunflower. Um, and I think one of the reasons that sunflowers as microgreens are so popular is because they actually have a slightly nutty flavor to them, which is kind of surprising in a green. We usually think of greens, they're gonna be bland, they'll taste like lettuce. I mean, what is lettuce? It's just packaged water. Uh, whereas sunflowers as a microgreen actually have a slightly nutty flavor to them and they have reasonably large leaves. They grow moderately fast, uh, but they're a relatively easy microgreen to grow. So here what we've got is actually at a uh, microgreen producer, they were growing microgreens in these, what looked like sort of like pressed, uh, pressed paper uh, trays. Radishes, as we mentioned, are extremely fast. There are several members of the same plant family, the mustard family or brassica family that belong to the radish. And a lot of the microgreens, in fact, belong to this family because they grow fast and because they often have good flavors. So as I said, microgreen uh, radishes do taste like radishes, so a bit spicy. Uh, we mentioned peas. Um, peas also have a pleasant pea-like flavor, which is kind of nice too. And you can see there's just this mass of roots down there in the bottom that we're not gonna eat, but we'll cut off the leaves at the top. Peas also are one of the microgreens that are the highest in protein. Others, wheat. Um, some of you may have bought wheat grass for your pets before. Some people grow this, for example, for their pet cats. You can eat wheat microgreens. Um, I can tell you right away, they are not my favorite. Uh, they taste like eating grass clippings. Uh, and if you do not harvest them young enough, they get really tough, tough and fibrous. You have to pick them at just the right stage. So in fact, the plants you see there in this picture are already a little bit too advanced. 
Mustard greens, very much like radish greens, they do have a mustardy flavor to them. So that's uh, nice to add. And uh, cabbage, you of course, you know, we think of a large head of cabbage, but cabbage sprouts actually do have a cabbage-like flavor, uh, slightly mustardy. Um, the picture you see here is actually a so-called red cabbage variety. They're not truly red, but you can see there's sort of a hint of a purple to the leaves. And so I mentioned it's nice to have a, a microgreen that tastes nice, but also something that looks nice too. So instead of just sprinkling greens in your sandwiches or salads or on a bowl of soup, uh, you can have something that has another color too. Those are some of the more common ones, maybe the ones that are a little bit less common, uh, but still have potential. One is basil. And so basil microgreens really do taste like basil. Not as strong though. And so sometimes people are a little bit disappointed when they start sprinkling uh, basil microgreens on pasta or on pizza or something like that. They do have a slight basil flavor to them, but not nearly as strong as mature basil leaves. Fenugreek um, is an herb. The seeds are kind of interesting. The seeds smell vaguely like maple syrup or caramel. Uh, the greens actually have a slightly spicy flavor to them. They belong to the same family as the pea and the bean, interesting enough, but sometimes used as microgreens. Chickpeas, very similar to growing peas. Um, so again, uh, fairly high in protein. Beets. Beets as microgreens are nice because they do add color. The stems are pink or purple, depending on the variety. Uh, in terms of flavor, well, they taste like beets. So beets have that slightly earthy flavor to them, which is uh, nice in some cases. Uh, coriander, of course, tastes like coriander leaf or cilantro as it's often known. Um, if you look carefully at this picture, you'll see, no, those are not little bugs crawling on the leaves. Those are the, the seed coats, okay? And coriander seed has a very different flavor from coriander leaf. I like both. Uh, some people like one, some people like the other, and some people hate all of them. Uh, coriander is an acquired taste. Uh, so if you're a coriander fan like, like me, well, you know, bring them on. I'm happy to have both the greens and the seeds. Onion microgreens. And this is one that's less well known. And again, the little dark things you see in the tips of the leaves, those are the seed coats. And onion microgreens taste like mild green onions. Um, not as widely grown as some of the other species of microgreens, probably because they're relatively slow. So it often takes three, sometimes four weeks from planting until they're ready. You might say, well, four weeks, that's not that long compared to growing tomatoes in your garden. But compared to some of the others like uh, radishes that are often ready in two weeks, uh, onions can seem a little bit slow. Okay, so uh, if I've got you hooked and you decide that yes, you definitely do wanna grow microgreens, the next question is, well, how do you do it? So in this picture here, this was actually a little experiment that I did with uh, one of my classes where we grew, grew several different species of microgreens in these big trays. This is one way of doing it, but there are several different ways of growing microgreens. So what do we actually need to do to grow microgreens? Well. Do a little flow chart here because we're academics. Uh, we have to prepare various materials. We may decide to soak the seeds ahead of time, or we may not. We plant the seeds. We get those seeds to germinate. We will then grow these seedlings for anywhere from one to four weeks. Then we're ready to harvest and eat them. So if we go through these things step by step, first of all, preparing materials. First thing, we have to grow these in some sort of container. There's a lot of different choices. So if we start with the one at the bottom, that black tray you see there, that is sort of the industry standard for growing microgreens. Why? Because it's there. There's no real logical reason that says that this container is better than any other side. It's known as a 10, 20 tray. Why? Because it's 10 inches wide, 20 inches long. Yes, we still use uh, old fashioned units uh, instead of metric here. Um, so it, people who grow commercial scale microgreens will very often use this type of tray just because it's available. 
Um, other people use smaller containers. So just above that, these are these pressed fiber containers that are filled with some sort of potting soil. That white tube you see there is an irrigation line. So when it's turned on, water will drip out of it into the tray. And then finally above that, that's my homemade uh, job there. I simply took little Tupperware containers, uh, lined them with paper towels and put seeds in them. So yes, you can do this at home. Perfectly safe, even without parental supervision. So once you've got containers, and I do have to emphasize they have to be clean, okay? And if not, you'll end up with some problems later on. Second thing, once you've got your containers, then you have to decide what sort of soil am I going to use to grow my microgreens on? And right away, I want to say soil in quotation marks because 99% of the time, we will never actually use garden soil. For a couple of reasons, garden soil may contain uh, insects in it, it may contain weeds, uh, plus it's dirty, it's dirt, so of course it's dirty. Um, but we want to try and keep our microgreens as clean as possible. So therefore, most of the time we don't use honest to goodness soil. Uh, people use things like peat moss. There's a synthetic material called rock wool, which is what you'll see in the upper center on the left-hand side. Uh, which is a very absorbent material. It's uh, physically, it's similar to glass wool that's used for insulation. And like glass wool, it's very itchy when it's dry. So you never handle it to when it's dry unless you're wearing gloves, but it absorbs a huge amount of water. Some people have grown microgreens actually on pieces of sponge. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, those little uh, fiber mats that you see there, that's hemp fiber. So you can actually buy mats made of a whole bunch of different things, various organic materials. Or the bottom center, uh, those uh, microgreens are growing on paper towels, which of course is probably the easiest thing to use at home. All you want is something that is clean and will absorb water. And once you've got that, you've got something to grow microgreens with. So once we've got our clean containers, We've got a suitable uh, medium in which to grow our seeds. Now we just need to find someplace warm to grow them. So it's, it's got to be someplace that's warm, that's clean, and that has light. So you think, okay, well, I'll just stick it a corner in the kitchen. Uh, it's got to be a place where you're going to remember to water it because one of the most common reasons that microgreens fail is because you didn't water them often enough. Microgreens do need a surprising amount of water, especially uh, once they've sprouted. Okay, the other material, of course, that you're gonna need are seeds. And if you're, if you're an accountant and you're saying, okay, how much is this gonna cost me? Uh, one of your biggest costs in microgreen production is actually the cost of seeds. Not that seeds themselves are very expensive, one seed is, you know, one fraction of a penny, uh, but because you're using thousands upon thousands of seed for every batch of microgreens you're growing. So what are we actually looking for? Uh, we want seed that are fresh because old seed means bad germination. When I say bad germination, meaning that maybe half the seeds won't germinate. Um, and usually we want seeds where at least 85% of the seeds will germinate. Now, for some species of plants, it's not a big deal. So for example, with uh, radishes or cabbage, you can have seed that's two, three, sometimes four years old, and the germination is still pretty good. I've had five-year-old basil seed and still gotten excellent germination. On the other hand, certain other species do not germinate very well when you've got old seed. Coriander is a good example. Once coriander seed is more than two years old, you'll be lucky if a quarter of the seed actually germinates. So to be on the safe side, you wanna make sure that you've got fresh seed. Another thing, although in theory, you could use any seed to grow microgreens, you wanna make sure that it's what's known in the, in the trade as untreated seed, meaning this is seed that has not been treated with any pesticide and does not have any coating on it. Usually if you look in seed catalogs and you start searching for microgreen seeds, usually it is seed that's guaranteed to not be treated in any way and has a very high percent germination. Now, 
There are many, many seed companies throughout North America. I put a short list here. You can try these. I, I, I'm not getting any kickbacks from any of these companies, so don't worry. I'm not trying to favor any one of them. But all of these six do specialize, among other things, in selling uh, microgreen seeds. So uh, for those of you who are uh, close by in the Montreal area, well, WH Perron, of course, is a well-known seed company. Uh, those of you who are in the Maritimes, Vessi Seeds is based in PEI. Uh, William Dam Seeds is in Ontario. West Coast Seeds is in BC. Uh, uh, Microgreens Canada is also in Ontario. And Johnny Selected Seeds is based in, in Maine and Northeastern United States. But all of these seed companies will ship seeds long distances. And if you simply Google, you know, microgreen seed and put in your, your local town or something like that, I'm sure you'll come up with other suppliers too. But all of these have long, long lists. We'll have dozens and dozens of different species of seeds available for microgreens. Okay, so you've got your seed. And if you read stuff about microgreens, they say you've got to pre-soak your, your seeds. You don't have to, but it may help actually speed up germination. So what is pre-soaking? It's actually the same thing. If you're gonna make pea soup from dry split peas, they'll always say, look at the, the label, it says soak the seeds overnight. So it's the same idea. You're softening the seeds before you actually get them to sprout. So how long do you pre-soak? Anywhere from three to 12 hours. It's simply gotta be in warm water. And once you've soaked, you then drain the seeds and rinse. And the idea of pre-soaking is to get the seeds to absorb water because that's the very first step in germination. So this in theory you could do with any seed, but tends to be done mainly with species that have very large seeds. So things like beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils, sunflowers, uh, corn or wheat, or with certain species that have very tough seed coats. So for example, coriander and parsley seeds are notoriously slow to germinate, especially parsley. So if you wanted to grow parsley from microgreens, it would be a really good idea to soak the seeds first, then plant them. That'll really speed things up. The same thing is true with beets and chard. But you don't absolutely have to. This is not an absolute requirement. The problem with pre-soaking, of course, is now you've got wet seed. It's much harder to plant wet seed than dry seed, because of course the wet seeds are gonna to stick to your fingers. So that's why people usually only do pre-soaking with species with very large seeds like corn or beans or peas. So you've got your seeds, you may have pre-soaked them or maybe not. Now you're ready to plant them. And often what's surprising is how many seeds you need. So if you look at the photo on the bottom left-hand corner, those are fenugreek seeds and see how close they are together. So how many seeds do you actually need? Well, it really depends on the size of the seed. So fenugreek seed is quite small. So we put a lot of seed on each container or each tray. General rule of thumb, and this is very, very rough guideline, is about one to two seeds per square centimeter. So square centimeter, that's, you know, this space here, one to two seeds in that space. Um, so what does that work out to? So here's your math question for the day. Uh, if we have a little uh, Tupperware container and I measured mine at home, it was 14 by 14 centimeters. So that means I have a Tupperware container that's 196 uh, square centimeters. So times one to two. So that's from 196 to 392 or to keep it simple, I won't say what the last S means. Let's say between 200 and 400 seeds. Okay, so 200 to 400 seeds in that little Tupperware container. That's a lot of seeds. So you can see why if you're growing microgreens on a large scale, uh, the seed cost can really add up. Okay, now germination. So we've got our seeds. We maybe pre-soaked them, maybe not. We've planted them in some sort of tray, some sort of container. We're ready to get them to germinate. And hopefully germination will be fast, just a couple of days. And here's where you've got to keep it warm. So some people like to actually do the microgreens in the kitchen because that's probably the warmest place in the house, especially in the winter. You want it to be humid. Those seeds must not dry out. So you're probably going to be watering them or spraying them with water maybe once or twice a day. 
And at this point, they can be kept in the dark. In fact, many people actually recommend you keep them in the dark for the first couple of days. After that, you probably want to give them light. So once they have sprouted, now hopefully you're going to get really, really fast growth. And fast growth means those plants are using up lots and lots of water. So what do we actually need here? Usually most people like to have a spray bottle, keep those seedlings wet at all times, do not let them dry out. How long do we keep them growing? As we said earlier, a one to four weeks. Usually for most species, it's gonna be about two weeks, two and a half weeks. Ideally, the temperature will be a little bit cooler. So we want it very warm for germination. And then after they sprouted, we may actually want them to be a little bit cooler. So that's why you may want to start the germination in the kitchen and then move them to, I don't know, the, the dining room or some or living room or someplace that's a little bit cooler. Watering at least once a day if you're using a spray bottle. And lots and lots of light, because if you don't give them light, they will never turn green. One of the questions that sometimes comes up, do microgreens need fertilizer? In theory, they do not. And the reason for this is because we're growing very young plants, virtually all the nutrients these plants need are present in the seeds. Sometimes people recommend putting in a very, very small dose of fertilizer with some of the microgreens that re require more time, the ones that take three or four weeks. They say you'll get a nicer green color and so on and so forth. Uh, but to be honest, I've grown most microgreens and little projects with my students. We haven't used any fertilizers at all. So watering, as we said, we can use with these little spaghetti tubes here. That's, that's a commercial grower you're seeing here growing um, sunflower microgreens. And in this case, we're using larger trays. These are uh, radish microgreens that you're seeing in these trays here. And at this point, the microgreens get really, really tall because they're grown so close together. So remember, as we said, um, you know, one to two seeds per square centimeter, that's a very, very close spacing. So of course you get lots and lots of leggy stems here, but that's perfectly normal. So once you've decided that your microgreens are ready to harvest, uh, in this case, this particular person has just popped them out of a tray and we're actually looking at the roots. Uh, I think this was Anis, the, the sample that this particular grower is showing us here. Um, so if you want to go high tech, you want to go all the way. So these folks here have actually invested in a huge industrial size microgreen harvester. So you load the trays onto a conveyor belt, run them through this apparatus and they get chopped off mechanically. Okay, this will probably set you back about twenty dollars to $30,000. So if you've got that in your bank account and you've got nothing else to do, you can buy yourself a microgreen harvester. There's actually a neat video clip that you can watch the whole scene, see the whole thing operating. Uh, but for us lesser mortals, we'll go with scissors and harvest everything by hand. And uh, if you really wanna be really, really careful, you know, food safety conscious, you may actually wear gloves where you're harvesting them. So what you're doing now is you're giving these microgreens a severe haircut. Uh, so trim off as much stem as possible, but this is one of the tricky things. You wanna get as much stem as possible, but without picking up any dirt. Um, so this is why people prefer not to use real soil to go microgreens so that you're not getting any dirt on your, uh, your greens. And then we get these piles and piles of microgreens, which are simply leaves, and often there's only one, two or three leaves on each microgreen and that's about it. So they're basically just very fast growing salads. So once you've harvested them, well, hopefully you're gonna eat them as quickly as possible. Uh, microgreens do not keep very well. They're very perishable. Uh, when you buy them in the grocery store, they're often uh, sold in these clamshell containers. So the photo you see on the left-hand side, um, they can be stored for up to a week, but after a week, they will start to uh, get a bit mushy. They'll get a bit dehydrated in some cases. They're difficult to store because if you keep them wet, uh, they will actually get mushier faster and maybe even get moldy. So the idea is you cut them and then you eat them. And if you want more, you cut some more and you eat some more. 
So on the bottom uh, picture, they're actually wrapped in Ziploc bags, but again, you can't keep them for very long. If you are gonna store them, definitely put them in the refrigerator. Now, sometimes bad things happen to good microgreens. And so I just wanted to show a couple examples of some problems that can show up if you grow them yourself and what you can do about them. So first of all, sometimes you may simply get poor germination. So if you look at these two trays here, uh, one with radishes, the other with fenugreek, you can see there's a whole bunch of seeds that seem not to have germinated. A couple possible reasons. One, maybe it was poor quality seed to begin with. Two, maybe the temperature was too cool. Okay, so maybe if we had raised the temperature by a degree or two, it would have gotten faster germination. Or three, maybe my watering was too uneven. So part of the tray was nice and wet, whereas part simply remained dry. So any combination of that, temperature's too cold, uh, conditions too dry, or seed too old can lead to poor germination. Second problem, mold. Okay, well, sometimes you may grow microgreens and see this, ooh, this white stuff growing there. Well, this is a good news, bad news story. Actually, what you're seeing there is not mold. So on the left-hand side, where it says not mold, those are actually hairs on the roots. Okay, so this is perfectly normal. The roots of all plants have hairs on them, unlike my head. Uh, on the right-hand side, on the other hand, uh, you've got some, uh, an example of sunflower seeds where you definitely have mold. So how can I tell the difference? Well, if it's mold, it looks more like miniature spider webs growing over the plants. So why am I getting mold? There's a couple possible reasons. One is maybe I planted too many seeds. So if the seeds are too close together, and especially if I have a lot of poor quality seeds, so this is tempting, you might say, oh, I've got some old seed. Well, I'll just double the amount. Well, now that means you're gonna have a lot of dead seed in your trays, not germinating, and that's often where mold gets started. Or maybe you're trying to grow them in the dark. Again, microgreens do need light, so next to a nice sunny window. So if they're kept constantly in dark conditions, you're more likely to get mold. Or maybe you started off with dirty containers. So again, you know, cleanliness, 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 the three C's of uh, microgreens. Uh, make sure that whatever container you're using whether it's plastic trays or you're using paper towels, they've got to be new paper towels, that they've got to be clean. And you want to make sure that you're getting some air circulation. And again, this is probably why planting too many seed leads to mold. It's because too many seed, you get poor air circulation. Third problem, sometimes the stems look too leggy. In other words, uh, because the plants are so close together, or maybe you are not giving them enough light, it's a natural tendency for plants to grow tall and skinny. I'm sure you've seen this with house plants before. A house plant in a dark room will always grow tall and skinny and then start to lean towards the window. The same thing is true here with microgreens, except in the case of microgreens, we actually expect them to get leggy. So I'm not too worried about these microgreens that I see in this picture here. They're in fact about the right height. Another problem that may not really be a problem, sometimes you'll grow seeds and they start to look slimy. And so what you're looking at here, these are basil seeds on a uh, fiber mat. And instead of being black, the way basil seeds normally look, they look blue and slimy or blue gray and slimy. Actually, in the case of basil seeds, this is perfectly normal. Uh, that some seeds naturally ex exude this slime, okay, well, the technical term is mucilage, uh, when they get wet and that is perfectly normal. So we'll see this with basil, with flax, shea seed, uh, arugula seed, they will tend to get slimy. It is in fact not a problem, it is perfectly normal. But it does mean that we should not pre-soak these seeds. If you pre-soak basil seeds and they start to develop this mucilage, it beca they become sticky. And then if you try and plant them, they will just stick in lumps as opposed to spreading out thinly over the mat. So uh, we've grown our microgreens, we've harvested them, we've uh, maybe put some in the fridge because we uh, grew too many, we couldn't give them away. Um, and then we start to wonder, are they actually safe to eat? Is there any risk uh, in terms of health uh, concerns? 
Um, there are actually have been a few um, reported cases of food poisoning to, uh, because of microgreens. Now, I'm not saying this to scare you, uh, because in fact, there are cases of food poisoning from things that are completely different, food poisoning from uh, fish, uh, from meat and things like that too. Um, actually in the period from 2018 to 2020, uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency recorded five cases of bacterial contamination in microgreens. So it's not something that happens very, very often. But there's always been this idea that because microgreens are grown in very humid environments, they're watered constantly, and there's a lot of handling, okay? A lot of it is hand harvested and hand packed, that maybe there'd be some risk of spreading things like salmonella or listeria. So it can happen, but as I said, it is quite rare. Now, the real question here, can you get rich growing microgreens? Okay, so this is what you're really wondering, and that's why you're here is to say, can I make a million dollars and retire early? Well, according to Statistics Canada, yes, Stats Canada collects information just about everything. Uh, over the past five years, uh, Canadian growers have produced an average of $5.5 million worth of microgreens. Now, this is what is known as the farm gate value. So that's the dollars that the producer gets not what the grocery store gets and not what you pay for, which is probably several times higher than $5.5 million. These are a high value crops. So maybe a couple other key numbers we should look at here. So if we actually break it down to a square meter basis, so square meter, that's the size of your card table, um, potentially you could produce $3,800 worth of microgreens per year. Okay, and that's not for one crop, but again, remembering that you're going to grow a new crop maybe every three weeks. So you grow a crop for three weeks, you harvest it, you clean out your table, you plant again, you grow another crop for three weeks and so on and so forth. So that means that you're gonna have about um, you know, 18 to 20 crops per year, depending on, on the, how many weeks you need to grow them. So $3,800 per square meter, as so you think, aha, okay, I'm gonna make it rich, except, there's a lot of costs involved. As I said, the seed costs could be quite high, but actually the biggest cost, according, according to most studies, is actually salaries. So um, we're then going to spend about $3,330 uh, on various costs and about half of that, so about $1,500 per square meter is labor cost. Very, very labor intensive. Think of washing all those containers, planting all those seeds, clipping off all those microgreens, packing them into clamshell containers and then taking them off to market. So that's a lot of labor. So if we do our revenues, minor costs, okay, we're, we're economists, uh, that still gives us what we call in the, the agricultural uh, um, sector, the net farm income, uh, $470. But that's still not bad. That's per square meter per year. So that means for your card table size, a grow, a grow up here, you are generating $470. So I think, okay, well, that's for one card table. What if I convert my entire basement into a grow up? Okay, growing microgreens here, not certain other plants, growing microgreens. Um, can I actually make some money there? So you'll actually see people who've done this where they've converted their garage or their basement into a growing operation where they'll put in thousands upon thousands of trays growing microgreens under lights and things like that. And the money looks pretty good. But as they always say, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Um, it is a high value crop. There is a lot of money to be made in selling microgreens, but it's a niche market. And by definition, a niche market is a small market. So we have uh, over hundred people online now. If all 100 of you now go home tonight and start up an operation like this in your basement, uh, and start growing microgreens, well, within a year or so, you will have flooded the market and you will no longer be making the, that $3,800 per square meter. You might be making half of that because you know, supply and demand, more, uh, more supply, uh, demand stays the same, the price goes down. So yes, there is money in microgreens, but we're not all gonna get rich doing so. Um, now, if you're really, really hooked and you definitely want to know more, I've put here several useful references here. Uh, the first one is actually a very, very detailed guide that just came out last year uh, on growing microgreens. Um, you'd have to, I 
think it costs something like 30 or $40. I can't remember what the price is. It's available only print and only in print form. There's a lot of information available for free online. So uh, some of these have been put together by uh, some of the uh, state extension agencies um, in the United States, some by uh, provincial ministries of agriculture. So um, one by the third one by MAPAC, the Quebec Ministry of Agriculture, the fourth one by the Agriculture uh, Department of Alberta. Let's put that together. Um, the uh, fifth and sixth one where it says Stone, see, okay, that refers to Curtis Stone. Uh, Curtis Stone is one of the gurus of the uh, urban farming movement. He has loads and loads of videos on YouTube and you'll see him go around and interview uh, people who grow microgreens in their basement and garage. It's actually fun to watch. Uh, there's some, some pretty interesting stuff in there too. Um, the reference at the very bottom there is more uh, sort of a scientific reference is more about um, the nutritional aspects of microgreens and how much, you know, nutrients, vitamin C, C, vitamin A, vitamin D, and so on and so forth. And I didn't mention this at the very beginning, uh, but one of the big advantages of microgreens, and we talked about nutrition uh, earlier on, is that microgreens do contain a substantial amount of vitamin C, which most seeds do not. Okay, if you ate just bean seeds and barley seeds and wheat seeds, they are very rich in protein, very rich in starch. Some of them are rich in oils and certain minerals, but they're very low in vitamin C. Uh, vitamin A, so-so, depending on the, the species. But microgreens are actually quite rich in vitamin C, and many of them are quite rich in vitamin A as well. So oh, this covers many of the things that I wanted to talk about. Microgreens, of course, can be used in a whole bunch of different ways. Here we've got them in a stew. They can be used in salads, soups, uh, uh, on pizzas, just about everything that you'd ever want to put greens on. Um, yes, they're small, but they taste great. So that covers most of the things that I wanted to talk about. And at this point, I would be happy to try and answer any questions that people have got. Thank you, David, for this very exhaustive information on microgreens. I was starting to think to transform my house into a microgreen factory, but I think as I was listening to you, I was changing my mind. It's like, it's too much work. I don't want to flood the market. Uh, I don't want a lot of humidity in my, uh, in my basement anyways, but still they are good to eat. We have a few questions for you, David. I've collected them and I sort of tried to put them um, uh in in uh, categories okay um uh, yeah i'm, I'm just uh, looking okay so first i would like to remind everybody because the question came back several times if you're gonna if we're gonna send you the recording of the slides yes this session is being recorded and the link or the recording, depending on which one would be easier to, to send, will be sent to all the people who registered uh, by the uh, mcgill alumni office uh, so I'll start with the first question. Do the greens keep the same nutritional benefit uh, as the seed? And a question related to it, do they lose some of their nutritional value if they are served with a warm dish? Um, okay, so nutritional values. So as I mentioned, the mineral content of microgreens is as good as the seed. So if the seed, for example, has a lot of I don't know, magnesium or iron in it, the microgreens will also have that magnesium or iron. Um, the microgreens also will tend to have uh, similar amounts of protein as the seed. Um, and this would be particularly noticeable in some of the high protein uh, seeds, things like peas, beans, chickpeas, and so on and so forth that are high, relatively high in protein. Um, as I mentioned, the big, I think one of the big advantages of the microgreens compared to the actual seeds is they're higher in vitamin A, vitamin C, which are generally not found in seeds. So that would be probably one of the main benefits. Um, and then the other question was about what if you use them in warm foods? Uh, it depends if you're just sprinkling them. So for example, in this photo, I just sprinkled them onto a stew. Uh, the microgreens are still fresh they're going to maintain whatever nutritional value they have. If you actually cook them, that may change their nutritional value. So for example, 
vitamin C, if I remember from my nutrition courses, and this goes way back, so uh, someone catch me if I'm wrong, uh, but I believe if you actually cook things with a lot of a vitamin C, vitamin C tends to break down under intense heat. So if I actually sprinkled microgreens in a soup and then boiled the soup, they would not be as rich in vitamin C as eating simply the fresh microgreens. Thanks, David. I'll go on to the next question. Can they be grown in the apartment windows on the balcony? Do they need sun or just bright light? Uh, when we water them, should the water be at room temperature, temperature or can it be cold water? And when we soak them, can we use tap water or distilled water? Or should we use distilled water? So those are all about the production of my okay. Food. Okay, so yeah, some good production questions there. Um, maybe we'll start with the water business because that's really important. Ideally, you'd use warm water, warm meaning room temperature, so around 20 degrees Celsius, both for the soaking and for watering later on. Um, if you use cold water, it's not the end of the world, especially for some of the brassicas, things like radish, cabbage, broccoli, and so on and so forth, because they can take fairly cool conditions. Uh, where warm water becomes really important, however, is with certain species like basil or sunflowers that really, really prefer the much warmer conditions. But lukewarm or room temperature water is best when at all possible. Tap water is fine. You don't have to use distilled water, bottled water, anything like that. The only time you would not use tap water is if you had some concern about uh, safety. You know, For example, if there's been a boil water advisory or something like that. But assuming that your, your tap water is safe, then it, it's fine for uh, both for pre-soaking the seeds and for, uh, for applying the, the seeds later on. Um, the other question I think was about light. Light and balcony okay. window. Okay. Um, growing them actually by a sunny window is probably the, the ideal because you're getting the maximum amount of light. If you don't have a sunny window, then artificial light is fine. I've seen people use fluorescent tubes, for example. Um, be, the nice thing about fluorescent tubes, number one, is they're cheap. And number two, they don't generate a lot of heat, which means you can put them very, very close to your microgreens and they won't burn them or anything like that. Um, in commercial production, people are now starting to use uh, LEDs, light, emit, light emitting diodes, because they are even more efficient at using electricity than uh, fluorescent tubes. But LEDs are quite a bit more expensive than fluorescent tubes. But if you've got LEDs, they're fine. So you could use sunny window or artificial light. Both will work just fine. Uh, next question. How do we know when they are ready to harvest or are they too late to eat, to be eaten? So uh, you did mention the, the wheat. It looked as small or as big as the others, mm -hmm. but it would be very hard. So how do you know that? Is it just by... Trying, try yeah. So, some of it is just by trying. Usually, they'll say that a microgreen is ready when you've got one, uh, anywhere from one to three leaves on the plant, and the, the microgreen is about they'll say anywhere from three to five centimeters tall. Um, that's sort of a rough guideline. For most species, it's probably okay if they're a little bit overgrown. Um, that's not really a problem. The only one I found it's a problem is with the, the wheat and the barley, just because they get kind of tough and fibrous. And they're not as pleasant to eat. Uh, but for the radishes or here and this picture here, I think this is fenugreek that I've got on this one here. You can see they're quite young. They're just, just beginning to, uh, sorry, no, this is cabbage, uh, not uh, fenugreek. Um, that's just, just starting to produce some leaves there. So it's like one, two, three leaves plant is three to five centimeters tall, and that's about it. But even if it was a bit bigger, that would be okay. Okay. Uh, about the containers, um, you used, I think, a, 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 like a plastic container at home. Uh, how do we clean them? Is there any specific method or specific product that needs to be used to clean them or just put them in the dishwasher or wash them by hand? Yeah, dishwasher, washing by hand is fine. You just want to make sure that there, there's no residue, uh, no soap residue, and no bits of, of vegetation or anything like that in them. 
Uh, it's mainly if there was any little bits, say you've been reusing the same container over and over again, and there might be a couple of little pieces of leaf in there or some pieces of seed residue or something like that, that's places where you can get mold growing. So you just wanna make sure that it's thoroughly clean. In commercial production, they'll actually go farther and actually use uh, industrial cleansers and things like that, like bleach and so on and so forth. Um, but if you're just growing small amounts in containers, I don't think you have to go as far as using bleach. Okay. Um, when you clean the containers and you want to put the soil, although you said we shouldn't use soil from outside, but the substrate that we're going to plant the seeds on, uh, where do you get the substrate? You, I, I know you have shown us all those different things, and I know at McDonald campus you have your sources. Do we have access to these? Can I go to the Ash Peron and get that? Uh, would it be of good quality, or I have to go to a very specific place? Um, actually, a lot of garden centers actually now sell microgreen growing kits. And so they will sell the substrates, which you can buy. You can buy the whole kit or just buy the substrate itself. Um, one of the ones that we tried were these little uh, fiber mats made of hemp. I must say I was not impressed with them because I found that they would, they would fall apart. If you tried to lift up one of those pieces of fiber hemp, they would just sort of disintegrate into many pieces. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, for, for growing at home, actually paper towels work really, really well. Uh, but you can, there's a lot of, of um, commercial potting mixes that are based on peat moss, and those are available in pretty much any uh, garden center. And they're the same type of, of uh, potting mixes that you might use to grow, uh, put in flower boxes or things like that. Okay, and you mentioned paper towels how many layers and one person was mentioning that one should not use recycled paper to uh, towels because there is a lot of chemicals added during this recycling uh, process uh, what do you think of that like first um, how many yeah. layers of paper towel and the type of paper towel why okay. this type and not the other type okay I must admit, I just tried what I had in, at home. I uh, made a, a quadruple layer. So just folded it over four times. Uh, why four times? Because that's what fit in my container. <laughs> it was just okay. for practical reasons. Uh, but also I wanted something that was thick enough. Okay. So I would say eyeball it basically. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to, to, um, to And somebody mentioned uh, Coco Choir. Mm -hmm. I've never seen the word, but I know what it is. Uh, you know, I, I guess any any um, uh, substrate would do, any fibrous substrate would do, like the cocoa yeah. substrate. Yeah, Yeah. the, the coconut coir, which is basically um, ground up coconut shells or coconut yeah. fibers. Um, it's It looks very much like peat moss. It's very absorbent like peat moss. Uh, and it works quite well. The one problem with coconut coir is sometimes it's high in salt, interesting enough. And if there's too much salt, that can actually slow down germination yeah. of a lot of seeds. You can get around this problem, however, by rinsing the coconut coir first. So if you soak it in water, let it drain, that will flush out the salts. Um, but you can certainly use coconut coir once it's been wetted. Okay. Uh, now to go to the uh, germination and, and growing itself. Uh, I have a few questions. The one of them says, once uh, it's cut or harvested, will more microgreens grow from the original roots? Unfortunately, no. So with microgreens, it's it's one shot. Uh, that's why you end up buying a lot of seed because you plant the seed, it grows, you cut it, and then you have to start over again. You have to plant more seed. Yeah, okay. Uh, is there a way to save seeds for another produce? Uh, good. Um, growing seed itself is, is can be a tricky business. Um, so sometimes I will save coriander seed for my coriander plants in my garden. Um, but for certain other species like growing broccoli seed or cabbage seed, is pretty complicated. I mean, cabbage, strictly speaking, is a biennial plant, meaning that it normally would only flower in its second year, which means you'd actually have to wait two years before your cabbage plant actually produced any seed. Uh, so that's why the seeds production tends to be a pretty specialized business. 
Um, and, and it won't be in the little container you have on your windowsill. That's it right. Now you need a large yeah. cabbage plant that's growing outdoors. So you know, producing seed is, is you know, a pretty big undertaking. So you have to be I, sure you want to do that. I, I think the person meant that by keeping the microgreens in the container, will they produce seed perhaps for the okay. next generation? I guess yeah. your answer to that is no. Um, how can one keep the seed costs low? Uh, somebody said that they can take regular seed and grow the microgreen, uh, like the regular seeds from the grocery store. Uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, you can certainly do that. And you'll see some companies will sell packages specifically as microgreen seeds, uh, but you really have to look at the price and see what you're paying for. Um, is it actually any better than regular seed? Uh, one way, of course, to keep the price down is choose the species that have large seeds and low cost seed. That may be another reason why peas and radishes are so common as microgreens is the seeds are relatively cheap compared to uh, certain other species like mm -hmm. coriander seeds, a bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to the nutritious value, uh, a question that was added uh, later in the series, which seeds have high protein? Um, it would be mainly those in the, the bean family. So uh, beans, peas, soybeans, uh, chickpeas. Um, lentils. Lentils would be another example. Those are the ones that tend to be the highest in protein. Okay, and I think I have one last question. Uh, what about missing the seeds with peroxide 3% mixed into four liters of water? So the, the, the recipe would be four liters and peroxide 3% uh, to obviate bugs and mold. So you can okay. double that amount or, or have that amount uh, depending on how much seed you have, but what do you mm -hmm. think? Um, I think in most cases, it's not necessary. If you've got good quality seed, there should not be any bugs or any mold on the surface of the seed. Uh, you might use peroxide to disinfect your tools. For example, you might use peroxide if you wanted to clean your containers um, or for example, scissors, or if you're using a knife to cut them. Um, but I would use the peroxide more for that than disinfecting the seed. Um, if the seed are good quality and they germinate quickly, mold should not be a problem. And if you're actually getting your bugs, then there's probably other problems. It probably means that you're watering too much or maybe your soil, often the source of insects uh, will be the soil, not the seeds. I think uh, I've come to the end of my list. That's it. <laughs> I'm, I'm done with my list. Like I'm looking at all the questions I took notes of. I think I've asked them all. Uh, people in the audience, if you think your question has not been answered, please. Oh, no, nobody's saying anything. Well, that uh, ends our session today. Thank you very much, uh, David, for this very informative session. I, I see a lot of thank yous, uh, very interesting. Uh, a reminder that this will be uh, sent to you. We have a Facebook page. Uh, I would also add my uh, voice to Julie's and remind you to visit our uh, crowdfunding page in the name of one of our colleagues who had the MSM for, for a number of years and who was a musician. And uh, keep uh, an eye on our uh, news for our next uh, activities. Julie, would you like to add something? Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And thank you very much, David, for your thorough presentation. I learned a lot, and I'm really keen to give it a try myself. So thank you so much. And as Micheline said, please follow us on Facebook. We um, will keep you informed of what we are planning uh, next. And um, that's it. Hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs>